introduction. <laughs> okay. Well, look, I'm, I, I don't have it to hand, John, but listen, I'm, I'm sure people will forgive me if I say. Um, listen, it's half seven. In fact, it's 7.31 by me. So yeah. um, I think we'll, we'll kick off and let our main speaker get stuck in. Uh, our speaker tonight is John Regan. Um, from Maynooth University, Ireland, and John is at least a lecturer, if not a researcher, or probably both. Um, and he's going to talk about a subject which, of course, fascinates us all, black holes across cosmic time. Sounds fascinating. So listen, everyone, I'm going to mute you, and I would appreciate um, if you put your questions onto the chat site, and we'll pick up the questions at the end. Okay, John, can you uh, can you say something so as I make sure I haven't muted, muted you? Yeah, I think it should be probably working. It is. It's working fine. It's working fine. Perfect. A few people I'm just going to admit here. And after that, you're good to go. Okay, great. Sorry about that. I didn't realize I was, I was hosting tonight. I didn't realize Paul was away. So apologies for that. Apologies for uh, unprofessional, uh, unprofessional introduction. Not at all. I think you're muted there. Uh, do you want me to start? Yeah. Okay. Grant. Okay. Cool. Okay. Thanks everybody for um, for joining and and Terry especially for. Um, for inviting me to give this talk so so yeah as uh as just in the introduction i'm um i um i guess a researcher i suppose at uh, Maynooth university and i've been working on black holes and black hole origins for for at least a decade now um so i'll probably i so the outline i have is just to first of all really kind of introduce people it'll be you know, very, very uh, basic introduction to what are black holes to start with. Um, then I'll move on to talking about how black holes form, um, the different classes of black holes. So we, we tend to class black, ho black holes by their mass. Um, and I'll, <clears throat> I'll go through that. Um, I'll, I'll then move on a little bit to um, black hole observations and, and then finally to black hole origins. But I suppose on the observational side, it's been or we're living through a bit of a golden age, it feels like, in, in terms of black hole observations, just with gravitational waves and, and the um, recent um, image of a black hole you might have seen in the newspapers or, or so on. And I'll, I'll talk about a bit about those and what, as well, what we can expect in the future as well. Um, so I'll start with a, with a bit of a, a black hole history tour. Uh, it's always good to get some context on these things. Um, so hopefully that's Einstein there on, on the left hand side and um, just over 100 years ago now he developed uh, his general theory of relativity and it obviously was absolutely fundamental and made us uh, reevaluate our understanding of of, um, of the universe and of, uh, of certain characteristics of the universe as well. So prior to general relativity of course we had we, we worked in a Newtonian framework and Newton um, actually understood that it couldn't be a complete theory. So it had a lot of, a lot of shortcomings um, from, from his perspective and, and some of his contemporaries would have felt the same way. You know, it, it essentially predicted that force uh, traveled at an infinite speed. So if you had two masses and no matter how far away they were um, from each other, they could communicate at an infinite speed. And uh, this wasn't really a problem per se, like in terms of using the theory. Because you know, uh, whenever we use the theory, things are always pretty close together, and, and understand that. But nonetheless, Newton was very, um, very concerned about this, and so was um, so were his contemporaries, and, and Einstein as well was was also concerned about this. And in some ways, that led him to to drive a new theory and uh, his kind of thought experiments, and you know, genius, I suppose, brought him to general relativity, and it totally restructured. Um, how we understand the universe and what we were able to predict about the universe. So out of, um, out of general relativity was in some sense, modern cosmology was born. Um, cosmology had existed um, prior to general relativity, but it was more of a philosophical subject, you know, where you try to understand the origin of the universe and what it meant to be alive, I suppose, and so on. But what general relativity did is quantified that. And 
allowed us to put some solid equations down for, and it's essentially one of the um, one of the effects of general relativity. Um, here on the left, we've Carl Schwarzschild. Um, you might have heard of a Schwarzschild metric or a Schwarzschild black hole, but Carl um, was a Russian um, mathematician, probably or Russian physicist. It was less clear back a uh, hundred years ago. People kind of just worked on problems. Um, but what he did was he was actually fighting in the trenches in World War I, and he discovered an exact solution to Einstein's field equation. So Einstein actually hadn't got, hadn't actually solved his own equations at this point. And um, he also thought a lot of them were, uh, didn't, wouldn't have any solutions. Um, but that wasn't true, actually. And Schwarzschild derived a, a solution to Einstein's uh, equation in 1916. Um, and he, the title of it is there at the bottom on the on the field of gravity of a point mass in the theory of Einstein. Okay, and what he actually derived was a black hole solution. Um, he communicated this to Einstein, and Einstein um, was intrigued by it for sure. Um, and I, I think those communications still exist, but he didn't really. Um, he didn't really give much physical underpinning uh, to it. He, he thought it was an interesting um, solution to um, to the, the equations of general relativity, and he was very very happy that somebody had um, found some solutions. Um, but he wasn't that he wasn't that interested, like in in the the physical ramifications of it, and he didn't didn't quite frankly believe it. Um, he he uh, Schwarzschild essentially predicted a black hole, but. Um, or, or um, really a singularity, uh, a point of in, some, something infinite, one over zero, if you like, in general relativity. But um, yeah, like Einstein then, well, as, as he should in some ways, when, when a theory starts to predict infinities, you, 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 um, <laughs> it, it can mean a couple of things. One, it can totally mean your theory is wrong. Or else it could mean if you're lucky that um, your theory is okay, but you shouldn't go in that direction, maybe, that that's, you, you, you've done something unsound in it. Um, neither of those things turned out to be true, actually. Uh, the theory is sound, and Schwarzschild's solution was also sound, but um, but at the same time, it was a, a very exotic uh, solution, so Einstein was somewhat skeptical about it. Um, what it predicted, I was reading through, we know, reading through what I'd written down here, read through this a few times where I say, a black hole is essentially ripped Space itself, I um, probably shouldn't write that down because I don't hear this. Um, so I'll leave it there for a moment, but I can come back to that at the end if someone has any questions. Um, so it results generally from the catastrophic collapse of a massive star. That's definitely true because in order to, to generate Schwarzschild's solution to uh, the Einstein field equations, you need to get a lot, a lot of mass in a very small volume. The only thing that uh, we know of that could do that is a star collapsing. And so a star is already a very dense object held up by radiation pressure, okay? So when a, when a, um, when a mass collapses like a star does to, to form the star, it essentially generates a lot of, it's like a new, it's, it's, as you know, a nuclear fusion reaction, reactor. And all of those um, reactions generate a huge amount of radiation, which keeps us nice and warm, of course, um, but it also holds the star up against gravity. So gravity is, is, is the force that's opposed, uh, sorry, radiation is the force opposing gravity at that point. Okay. The trouble is, like any um, anything that produces energy, it needs fuel. That fuel runs out, and as it, once the fuel runs out, that radiation pressure disappears. And if the star is massive enough, um, then it collapses in on itself, and that is where a black hole forms, and that's where the Schwarzschild solution um, comes into play. Um, what's probably more sensible. So the top I've written here that it's essentially a rip in space itself. And that's that's one interpretation, I suppose. The better interpretation is here at the bottom. There's a singularity. And that singularity is surrounded by an event horizon. The event horizon is some area, some area or some uh, distance from the black hole. So this is the event horizon here. The event horizon marks the point at which light can no longer um, escape. So outside of the event horizon, um, you can see light um, can move away from the black hole, or move. Yeah, inside the um, black hole, even if light were um, produced in here, and almost certainly is, 
you cannot escape now the black hole. The, the pull of gravity is so strong that light can't escape. And that, by definition, is the black hole. So everything inside of, of this uh, event horizon is the black hole. The event horizon is not a physical um, boundary or anything like that. You don't cross and feel anything if you crossed the event horizon. It's, it's simply a, um, a point at which the curvature or the gravity has become so strong that light can no longer escape. Um, if you take the... Um, the I suppose the equations to their um, to their end, you do end up with a singularity at the center. That is little less little less clear um, mathematically for sure. Mathematically, a singularity is completely undefined. It's something where the uh, equations have, have produced an infinity, and that always means that something's not right. And that's okay actually, um, because probably at those scales, we should we we really need a quantum theory of of gravity. So, so um, general relativity is not that. General relativity and quantum mechanics or quantum field theory are, we have not been able to join those theories together. Um, so probably uh, this is, I think, a, a fair uh, thing to say is that general relativity works everything outside of that singularity. And then the theory breaks down at those tiny, tiny quantum scales. And that's fine. Um, that just tells us that we haven't got a theory at the moment to tell us what happens at the very you know, the very core of a black hole, if you like. And we should then, therefore, I, in some ways, not worry about that, okay? Um, we understand that a black hole forms, which is fantastic. And then something at the center, our, our theory that told us a black hole forms breaks down. And that's fine. We should leave it at that at the moment and wait uh, or work on, I should say, maybe a quantum theory of gravity, at which point we'd have a better understanding of actually what's happening at the center of a black hole. And lots of people are working on that. It's not easy, obviously. Um, but um, what is uh, more interesting maybe is, uh, so this was a Schwarzy solution, the 2GM over C squared. This kind of defi defines the, uh, the event horizon. So you need a, a hell of a lot of mass inside a very small volume, and you can generate this black hole. And like I said, it's only stars that we understand can do that. Um, so this was all fine. And this was all um, uh, developed, let's say, 100 years ago or close to it. But it garnered almost no attention whatsoever. A very small minority of people studying general relativity. And as you can imagine, that was a small amount of people anyway. So it was only a small amount of a small amount um, really took this seriously. And that, that situation held for about, about 50 years. Um, so half a century. And it wasn't really until the 1960s. Uh, so quite a long time later that um, people started to actually believe in black holes before. So for 50 years, pretty much nothing. There were some people working on it, for sure, um, but no progress, really. You know, you can't do anything without observations, and there was no observations. And there was nothing to indicate observations, I suppose, nothing to go and look for. Um, but then then, um, then things did start to, to kick off. Um, our telescopes improved a lot, and we started to see very bright objects in the sky, very bright in the X-ray in particular. Um, pulsars uh, as well. So Jocelyn Bell, of course, is famous for discovering the first pulsar. And this kicked things off as well. So there's these exotic stars um, were found in, you know, in the nearby universe and, and they were understood to be neutron stars. So these were incredibly dense objects. And so uh, pulsars were spinning neutron stars. And that's where we see the pulses from the pulsars. And this, uh, this, of course, started to open Pandora's box this morning. So obviously, um, if you're a theorist now, you, you straight away see, well, hold on now. If we have very dense neutron stars, where does this end? You know, um, what happens is we just get more mass and we can get in, in the same volume. Won't things just be denser? And then people started to take the idea of a black hole far more seriously. A lot of people, um, and there was still a cohort who, who didn't think this was true, but but the, um, the tide was turning, I suppose. Um, so in 1964, um, it was on board a rocket, actually, that there was this uh, observation of a very bright X-ray source in the sky. Very, very bright. Um, this was, and this really, uh, as well as that, it came from an incredibly compact region. So this becomes difficult then. Um, very bright X-ray source from very uh, uh, very bright X-ray source from a very small area or very small volume, if you like, um, really is difficult to explain if you don't go down the black holes. Um, whereby um, you have a in this case, in this case, it was a high mass X-ray binary 
which is as as shown in the diagram here, you have a nearby uh, massive star, an O star or something like that. So something that's that's very massive. And then you have a nearby companion that has an incredible gravitational pull. And what it does is it starts to pull mass off the surface of the star, generates an accretion disk. Accretion is an incredibly efficient process, much more efficient than nuclear fusion, much, much more. Um, uh, becomes incredibly hot, so hot it emits in X-rays. And so this is a telltale sign of a very compact, um, very um, very gravitationally strong object. And it's almost impossible, or probably is impossible, to explain that otherwise in anything else but a black hole. So more and more observations were um, taking of, of Cygnus X1 which is now turned out to be the first black hole we've ever discovered. And that kind of heralded a new era of, of black hole uh, physics. And, um, and uh, Einstein, or sorry, not Einstein, but Hawking famously lost a, lost a bet, actually. Um, I think that's true. Um, about whether Cygnus X1 was a black hole or not. He, he actually said it wasn't, that it wouldn't be, but um, he... Um, he eventually um, gave in to the observer, uh, observers and and did did um, did see it his best um, that it was it was most likely a black hole uh, just because all of its characteristics all of the spectra that were taken just seemed to to point in that direction. Okay, so so that's kind of the black hole history tour. Um, just uh, to finish off, I suppose on on the black hole kind of basics. Um, how does a black hole form? So on the left here, we have our, our you know, the, the molecular cloud or the, the stellar nebula, as it, as it might be called. This is basically what the kind of gas or the mass of gas you need to form a star. And then you form a protostar. And then you can go in one of two directions, essentially. Um, and it all depends on the mass, what, what mass a star forms. And of course, you could get multiple stars forming in one of these nebulas, but, but let's see if we pick one of them. And if we if we come up this pathway here or this fork, uh, the top fork, we form a main sequence star like the sun. Anything about the sun's mass, or maybe a few times larger, up to around ten times the mass of the sun, something like that, it follows this pathway whereby it, it's uh, obviously a star for for billions of years. It then uh, turns into a red giant as it runs out of um, hydrogen, and then uh, is you know eventually. Um, bloats up and um, expands out before collapsing back onto itself as a white dwarf star. And that's going to be the, the evolution for our star. So we're about, our star is about 5 billion years old. And in about 5 billion years time, it'll, um, it'll turn into a red giant star. Okay, so we're about halfway through the lifetime of our star. <clears throat> if instead, though, we came down this pathway, down towards a, a very massive star, so anything more, anything greater than 10 solar masses approximately, in that case, things are somewhat different, and the mass of the star really plays a crucial role here. So if you go down this pathway, the uh, the lifetime of the star is now much shorter because the um, the, the lifetime of the star scales inversely to the mass. So the more massive the star is, the, the shorter it lives. And that kind of makes sense. It's, it's more massive, it's burning more fuel, and it burns that fuel more quickly. Um, so it, it doesn't live as long. So... In that sense, we get to be a, a red supergiant, a supernova, um, or at least it's, that's more than likely. But in, I, in any case, I won't get stuck in the details. But then you can either go down to be a neutron star, which is an incredibly compact object, uh, about two or three or four solar mass, down to be a black hole. Okay? And that is, that's a well understood and I suppose well determined pathway. So we see these things in operation in the sense that we see supernova uh, go off and we see neutron stars, we observe black holes, especially at this mass, and this all kind of fits together. So when we do our census of the black holes we see, and I'll come to that later on, it kind of all adds up. So our, our predictions for stellar evolution and the black hole masses we see and the neutron stars we see or observe and the masses that we observe them at all fit together in the way we predict and understand. And that all seems to make perfect sense. So we no reason to believe that those things are not true. However, um, I'll come now to the, uh, the masses of the black holes. So anything between zero and 100, uh, this is in 
times the mass of the sun. So I suppose I should have started it maybe. Well, zero makes sense. Um, anything above zero, I suppose. Um, you'll have a stellar mass black hole. And that's kind of what we just this bracket it. There's nothing special per se, but um, you can kind of think of this as well as being maybe the embryonic stages of a black hole or the black hole starting point. It, it has to start from somewhere. And for ones that are between zero and 100 times the mass of the sun, we call them stellar mass black holes. And there should be millions of those in our galaxy, millions of them. Because there were millions of stars of that mass in our galaxy, then you would expect millions of black holes of, of that size in our galaxy. Um, OK, after that, though, we come into what are called either massive or supermassive black holes. So the community is kind of divided on the terminology here. Um, and this becomes a little bit difficult, but we'll, we'll persevere. Anything above 100 solar masses, up to a billion, so quite the range here, um, is either in the massive black hole or the supermassive black hole bracket. Supermassive black holes are sometimes ones I've drawn a, a red line here, and this is at a million solar masses. So anything over a million solar masses is supermassive. Anything between 100 and a million is massive, or some people call them intermediate mass black holes. Um, but some, just to give you a feel, these are the kind of two two brackets that we have in the field, okay? And, and there's, it's important to bracket them at this because it does, um, there, there are good ways, good reasons for doing this and mostly because of our understanding of where each comes from, okay? So lots of questions remain unanswered, especially about the second uh, bracket. Um, their origin is unknown, okay? Now you might jump up and down and straight away and say, well, they came from the, the stellar mass black holes. Um, yeah, if only that was that simple. Um, that might be true, um, but if it is true, we're missing something. I'll come to that later. Um, so, because like the, the, basically the thing is, how the hell do you get from 100 solar masses to a billion? That's a non-trivial, non-trivial um, uh, physical process if it exists at all. Um, the number density is unknown, so we don't know exactly how many supermassive black holes are out there, um, or especially probably certainly don't know how many of these ones are out there. Okay, we can make good predictions for how many of these are out there based on stellar, stellar evolution. Like, you know, we know how many stars are in the um, Milky Way. We know roughly their mass scale. So we can say how many black holes are there. Fine. We can look at massive galaxies and we know that there's usually just one supermassive black hole in each massive galaxy. So we can get that number density. What we have absolutely no handle on is these. Absolutely none, because they're very hard to see, and we don't have a good idea of how they form. So we absolutely know this is like, you know, like I, I research this and I read papers on it, and you see predictions for the number density of this varying by, you know, 10 orders of magnitude. So some people think it's, you know, one number, and somebody else thinks it's 10 billion times bigger or 10 billion times smaller. So we're really are, are you know, not, not, in, not in a good place here. Um, related to this, the occupation fraction in galaxies. So we don't really understand, uh, we don't know how many of these are in each galaxy either. That's kind of related to number density, which is, uh, you know, because they're very hard to see. Um, and I'll come to that. And it seems, seems like I'm saying I'll come to things a lot. Um, okay, so back to the stellar mass ones, which we're better, we're more comfortable with. Um, so back in, um, back in 2015, in September 2015, we detected the first um, gravitational wave. And this was, this was a huge breakthrough now, in fairness. People have been working on this for 25 years. And, you know, not only that, but um, NSF in particular, the National Science Foundation in, in the US, had pumped billions of dollars into this. So, you know, somebody had convinced them that we were, the gravitational, gravitational waves were worth looking for and worth paying for. And, uh, you know, I certainly think that's true. Like this was a huge breakthrough, massive. Um, and it was it was incredible too, because, you know, it wasn't that they, you know, they were just making the machine slightly better and slightly better and slightly better and slightly better and slightly better. And, better. and then in the engineering cycle, uh, so this wasn't even like the science run. This was like where you, uh, you turn on the machine to make sure nothing goes haywire and they detected a signal. Now they had upgraded the machine at the time, and there was good, good hope that they were now going, they were getting down close to, to detecting gravitational waves. Their sensitivity was that good. But nonetheless, they turned on the machine and bang, they got a signal. 
and you know stop people dead in their tracks and so the first thing they had to do was they had to go and check because what they actually do is they they pump uh, fake signals into the machine just to calibrate the machine and make sure that the actual analysis tools are working okay so they had to go and check that nobody had just you know put in a fake signal into the machine well they checked that and nobody had and they looked at the data looked at the data hard for for you know several weeks if not months and they convinced themselves to know they had actually had detected a gravitational wave. So some quite incredible stuff. Um, and that was that was back in, like I said, September 2015. I think the it was the press conference was in February 2016. So about six months later. Uh, since then, um, all the blue bulbs here are black holes we've detected. So for example, if you take this one and this one, they've merged together to give it this one. This one and this one, this one. This is the most massive one. I'll talk about that in a moment. And all the blue ones are all the black holes we were all of the black holes we detected prior to gravitational waves. So you know, over 40, 50 years is the um is the proper ones. Over five years is the blue ones. So it's been absolutely extraordinary. And that's with LIGO. You know, suffering a pandemic, and uh, so it was shut down for about six months at least, and it gets regularly upgraded, which uh, puts it down for a year at a time. So probably in the last five years, it's probably been observing for two. Um, so it's it really is quite incredible. Um, it's also been um, been uh, revolutionary because it has observed the detection uh, of gravitation waves from, from merging neutron stars. That's that is that's that is um also very, very um you know revolutionary again to use the same word, but because so the difference there is that when two black holes merge, you don't get a, uh, an EM signal, so you don't get an electromagnetic signal. So you can't look at your use your optical telescopes to go and look at that. Uh however, with neutron star uh, mergers, you can you get both the gravitation waves and the optical signal. And so you get a hell of a lot more information out of that. And that's been crucial as well for understanding the production of heavy elements. Uh, so for example, gold, things like that are only produced in neutron star mergers. Um, so, so that's very interesting for understanding the chemical composition of our universe. So also, um, it will be, or at least it will be, not quite yet because we don't have enough, um, enough of them, but it will be good for understanding or crucial for understanding the uh, expansion of our universe or how fast our universe is, is expanding. Um, so that's an, it's another uh, very good way to do that. So anyways, that's all of, um, that's the, the stellar graveyard from uh, LIGO and Virgo. So this is actually the detector here. Uh, it'd be cool to go and see this actually. And so this is, uh, I can't remember if this is, um, this is one so this is i can't remember if this is the one living looks like this where you have two arms uh perpendicular to each other and you bounce uh light waves up and down um all everything else being equal they return to their base point you know in sync in sync if a gravitational wave though comes in and it bends space time so it bends that it essentially changes the length uh, from here to here, um, simplifying things a small bit now. But um, what happens is the, the waves don't come back and sync anymore. Okay, and if they're out of sync, something happened. Uh, if your sensitivity is strong enough, you detect gravitational waves. The only thing is when you have really strong sen sensitivity, you have to be careful, you can also detect like a truck driving past, you know, 10 kilometers down the road, they're you know incredibly sensitive. Uh, you can definitely detect an earthquake, so you don't want an earthquake happening as um, black holes are merging either. Um, so you do it took them decades to really nail this down. Um, so it really is a really difficult experiment. And it's not only that, but even if you detect gravitational waves, we needed um complementary breakthroughs in our understanding of um numerical relativity. So we needed to have. If you detect a signal, you need to be able to match that signal to what the what actually was happening out in space or you know some distance away. And so you have to have the the understanding of general relativity and the understanding of um, what happens in, during a black hole merger correct. And we have to match up those templates. So we have templates from from numerics and templates from 
the, the observations with the, the interferometer. And when they match, then that's the only way we know actually what black holes merge, their masses and so on. So that, that's actually how it works. And uh, so it really was a huge joint effort between the theorists and the observers, mostly obser obs observers now in fairness. Um, anyways, so this was GW 1905-21. These numbers are actually saying, so GW is gravitational wave, 19 is the year, five is the month and 21 is the day. So the 21st of May, uh, 2019, this was the most massive uh, merger detected so far. And, um, I say that because the uh, LIGO detector is down for maintenance, I think, at the moment. I think that's true. And um, so it hasn't, hasn't been turned on basically in the last year or so, last 18 months probably. So it must be due to come on again. I must, must check that out. Um, but anyways, this was the most massive um, merger detected thus far. Now, um, we get they get about one a month now, so once it's operational. So they are detecting them pretty quickly. Um, it lasted for less than 0.1 of a second, so you can see here the time in seconds, and it's it, it, it's a very short blip, you know. So it, you know we're just it's just about catching these things. It was at a distance of five gigaparsecs, which is an unimaginably crazy distance, That's half the size of the universe away. Crazy stuff. Um, like you know, you imagine like. And, um, you know, you know, don't want this to happen, obviously, but if two trains like two, you know, the bullet trains in Japan smashed into each other, that would be a catastrophic explosion or catastrophic incident. Uh, these things are traveling at 300 kilometers per 300 kilometers per hour. And, you know, they're you know, 600 maybe in relative terms and this hammer into each other would be absolutely um, catastrophic. Black holes, when they merge together, are, uh, you know, it can be upwards of 50 times the mass of the sun. And they're traveling, when they hit each other, they're traveling at half the speed of light. So this is an, quite an incredible event. And that's how we can see it across, you know, half the observable universe here. So it's quite incredible, um, you know, phenomenal. Um, so that's kind of stellar mass black holes. I just have to keep an eye on the time as well. Um, intermediate mass black holes then, this is these ones where I was a little bit, on, you know, where I was kind of like mumbling a small bit, I suppose, in terms of the, um, the mass spectrum or you know, how we define the mass of black holes. So anything under about a million solar masses is a um, is an intermediate mass black hole. So what we have here on the uh, the vertical axis here is the mass of the black hole in in um, in log to the base ten units. So this is ten thousand times the mass of the sun, hundred thousand times the mass of the sun, a million times the mass of the sun, ten million times the mass of the sun, hundred million times the mass of the sun, and a million times the mass of the sun. Okay, and down here is is um, Crazy, um, crazy parameters. This is basically a measure in if you're uh, an, an astronomer working on these things. Uh, this is this is kind of a way that they use to measure the the mass of a galaxy. So basically, this is the velocity dispersion. If you look, this is the velocity dispersion. So it's it's a measure of how quick the stars are moving around in the galaxy, and that tells you something about the mass of the galaxy because you can relate the speed to the to the uh, gravitational force basically through Newton's laws again, actually. And um, so if you like, just forget about this nonsense here, but imagine this is the mass of the galaxy and this is the mass of the black hole. And what people found about two decades ago or two and a half decades ago is actually that as you go up in galaxy mass, you also go up in black hole mass. And this is an unwavering relation. Like obviously there's scatter, definitely. And you'd expect that because no black hole or no galaxy is the same, same as no human is the same. But it's a very tight fit, very tight correlation. So they are interconnected. They co-evolve uh, with each other. So as the galaxy grows, the black hole grows. Or maybe it says the black hole grows, the galaxy grows. That, that is still yet to be fully determined. Um, the trouble is, as you push down here, you might be like, oh, where are the black holes down here? So they're, it's so hard for us to detect these. So, so hard. Um, so the LIGO detector that I just start, stopped Stop talking about that. Can't detect these black holes. These are too massive, actually, for it. It, it, it works in a very well-defined frequency, and that frequency is is related to the mass of the black hole. So it's good for black holes of around fifty to one hundred solar masses, or you know, give or take some more than that. But no,
completely blind to massive black holes. Uh, as up here. Supernova will claim that. And then every galaxy, we almost always see a supermassive black hole as well. So they're not always very easy to see, but generally they we can see them and um, they're always there. So whatever. And when galaxies are forming, they always end up with a massive super or supermassive black hole at the center. Black holes, these are also, you might have heard the word quasar. Uh, quasars were, again, um, a, bit, a bit like uh, when Cygnus X1 was discovered in the 60s, quasars were also discovered in the 60s. Uh, quasars, um, actually, they weren't quasars at the start. They were called quasi-stellar quasi objects, QSOs, um, because when people looked at the spectrum of these these QSOs, these quasi-stellar objects, they looked kind of like a star, but they weren't really a star. They were kind of funny stars, and uh, people really didn't know what to make of them. Didn't even know if they were in the galaxy or not. Some people thought they were, some people thought they weren't. Um, but eventually, over, um, over the course of about five or six years, maybe it was longer, maybe a decade, um, people understood that actually what they were looking at were not stars at all, um, but that they were accreting supermassive black holes. They were incredibly luminous. Um, and therefore must be at a great distance. So and, and initially people were like, oh, well, they couldn't be that luminous. Nothing could be that luminous. Like that's crazy talk. Um, and we were like, no, no, it's that luminous and therefore must be at a huge distance. So it took, you know, that takes a while for that to be accepted and for people to get the evidence together for that. They're visible essentially across the entire observable universe. So we can see quasars back to a time back, um, let me see, uh, 13.2 billion years in the past. So the universe is only 13.8 billion years old. So you're seeing the universe as it was when it was 600 million years old, so less than 1% of its current age. So they really, um, you know, that, 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 that luminosity, that brightness, those photons, that light that travels all the way from the black hole, all the way across the entire universe, essentially, and is then picked up by our telescopes here. It takes 13.2 billion years to get here, but it gets here. Um, the luminosity is driven by accretion. So um, as you can see in the, in, the, in the graphic here, essentially you have this black hole at the center and then you have this massive gas swirling around. As it swirls around, it gets incredibly bright, traveling at speeds close to the speed of light again. And it gets incredibly, incredibly bright. It's that brightness that we see. It's not the black hole per se. Black hole could be there, and if there was no gas going into it, it's completely dark to us. We'd never see it. But if there is enough gas there, and if, it, if it's traveling into the black hole, and there's enough of it, we can see it. And that's how we see black holes, essentially. That are, but again, we don't see the black hole. See the accretion disk. Um, OK, so then, um, yeah, good. Good timing. Um, so kind of getting towards the end now. So observing supermassive black holes. So relatively easy to observe the bright ones okay that kind of makes sense you know we can see bright things um so it doesn't take a genius to understand that um for nearby less luminous black holes dynamical measurements are are possible okay so that if you have if you have a black hole um nearby and it's not it's not consuming any matter it's not accreting matter we say um then we can't see it per se but what we can look at it is its indirect effects. So if there were stars going around it, for example, you'd see the stars orbiting nothing and they'd be orbiting a black hole. So if you see them orbiting nothing, you can infer the mass of the black hole because we, we understand dynamics quite well. And you know, we can model dynamics. Um, we can do that. So that's a good indicator. We can do that. Um, so, and that's actually what we did for the, or that's what we do, I should say, I suppose, for the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. The center of our own galaxy is not very bright. It, like it's bright enough for us to see it because we're close to it. But actually our best constraints come from the dynamical measurements. Um, we, see, we see the stars moving around. And because we see the stars move around and we can exactly measure their velocities and we know their masses, then we can measure exactly what they, the mass of the object they're orbiting. And that is very tight constraint actually. Um, what else? The other breakthrough, apart from gravitational waves that's happened in the last five years, so again, a golden age, has been this image of a black hole. So over the course of um, about a decade, what a group of um, astronomers did was they, not all the time, obviously, but 
from time to time, they would get, you know, they would take uh, measurements using these telescopes here that I've uh, on this graphic. So ones from across the globe, and they all would take measurements and of the black hole pointed. And then they put all the data together. Uh, the most important telescope in this actually turned out is ALMA. Um, as the uh, Atacama Large Millimeter Array, uh, it's in Chile, and uh, so in here, and it's an uh, incredibly powerful um, millimeter um, array, and that it only came online maybe, oh, I don't know, 10 years ago, I suppose, so, and it's it's got incredibly, uh, incredibly uh, good sensitivity, so it was the best one for actually doing this. Um, the others, of course, uh, were important too, but ALMA was the um, the core of this and what it, they did was they took um, a picture of a nearby galaxy, M87, which has got a, a black hole at its center of a billion solar masses, so very, very large. The galaxy is further away, but it was actually turned out to be easier to get a picture of the black hole at the center of M87 than it did or will be to get the picture of the one at the, the Milky Way. We haven't got that picture yet. But this one came out, I think it was in 2019, and you can see the, the time moving there on the top left. So the observation started in 2019 and went on for a decade. And it was this uh, image that they were able to produce. You can see clearly, um, at least once they put all the data together, the accretion disk moving around um, in real time, in human time. So we don't always get that in astrophysics or in astronomy. We don't usually always get to observe things happening on a human time scale. But it's because, you know, if, you, if gas moves at the speed of light, that tends to be good. Um, so that's that's... That was an incredible breakthrough. And um, the one at the center of the Milky Way, like I said, they're working on harder. So the black hole is smaller, so the gas moves even faster. And so it's harder for them to, to do the analysis. Even though it's closer, the gas is moving so quickly, it's hard for them to do the analysis. Um, so actually the one further away with the, the more massive black hole, it was bigger. And as things are further away, they actually move more slowly around. And uh, okay, like you're talking, um, are still moving incredibly fast and incredibly bright, but this was easier. Um, I'm sure the the observations of the Milky Way black hole will come, but they haven't managed to get them yet to a point where they're happy with them at least. Um, this I touched on already briefly. Um, this is the, the Milky Way black hole, and this was where um, Andrea Gaze and, and Reinhard Genzel, um, so these were two astronomers who worked on this data for over a decade as well. One's in UCLA and one is in Munich. And this was the observations of black holes at the center of the Milky Way. And you can see actually, so these stars here, these ones here, these are called S stars, uh, just simply because of their uh, rotations, they were coined as being S stars. And they make their way around a something in the middle of the, um, let me play that again, something in the middle of of the center of our galaxy. And that something is a supermassive black hole. And you can see if you pick one of them with your eye, you'll see the really you know crazy orbits these things go on. And in the top right there, you'll see the time moving by. So this was over the course of about two decades, these uh, observations were painstakingly taken. Um, so again, we were lucky here, I suppose, some, you know, one of the good things about black holes is that if you can get close enough to it, the time scales are short. You know, they, they come close to human time scales are shorter, or at least uh, for case of the UCLA group, it became, you know, short enough that they, somebody could do it over the course of, you know, half their career or something. Take these measurements and then determine the mass of the um, the Milky Way black hole. And that's that's actually what Andrea Gaze and, and Reinhard Genzel got the Nobel Prize for. Actually, they shared the Nobel Prize with Roger Penrose as well. He was a theorist who, were, he, he, he was based in Oxford and he works, of course, on black hole theory. Um, Andrea Gaze and, and Reinhard Genzel are, are you know, astronomers to the, uh, the observations, but you can see um, you can see quite clearly in this um, in this graphic how the uh, the stars move around the uh, black hole. So it's quite um, it's quite fascinating, and you, you know, like you can't see anything there. Of course, it's just you see these stars orbiting something. I'm trying to figure out what that is, and it's that because there are so many stars, we know the, know the position so accurately, we can get a very, very good handle on the, um, the mass of the Milky Way black hole. And that mass turns out to be about 4 million times the mass of the sun. Um, so it's, um, it's a supermassive black hole, but actually the black hole at the 
Milky Way is less massive than it should be. And we understand why we, we think we understand why that is, but um it should be more massive. Um so back to the origin of uh of black holes. So I'm nearly at the end now. Um the origin of stellar mass black holes um is well understood from the collapse of massive stars. So so we went through that in that diagram, you know, with the fork where we had the black hole at the start and collapsed into a black, uh, sorry, with a star at the start and collapsed into a black hole at the end. That's fine. The origin of more massive black holes, though, is, is much less well understood. Um, one of the things, one of the things I mentioned there was th these quasars and those quasi-stellar objects, these supermassive black holes, and they, you know, we see them across the entire observable universe. So we're seeing them at a time when the universe was only 600 million years old. But this is a problem because if the universe is only 600 million years old and the black holes already have a mass of a billion times the mass of the sun, it's difficult, if not impossible, to imagine they came from a stellar mass black hole. So the idea then that supermassive black holes originate from a smaller, tiny black hole becomes very difficult to reconcile with the time scale argument. Um, you know, that's that just it just doesn't make sense anymore. We can't get from something that was 100 solar masses to a billion solar masses in, well, 600 million years. Actually, it's half that time because it takes time. the star has to you know, be born and stuff first as well. So it's, it becomes an incredibly challenging problem. And in fact, Martin Rees, um, who many people might, might know the name, um, knew this was a problem. Um, he gave a lecture in 1978 in Oxford. He drew up the, he threw up this plot, and this was at a time, if you remember, when quasars had only been discovered, and they weren't discovered into great distances at this point. And his his argument was, look, if we keep discovering quasars, you know, at greater and greater distances, this is a major major problem. And he already felt it was a problem. He had drawn out this chart for how, you know, we could explain it was there were there supermassive stars maybe out there or collisions of black holes and somehow grow this grow black holes to be this phenomenal size. And um, so that was 1978. So what's that? Uh, that's like 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago, coming up on 45 years ago. And I would say, you know, we, I, like, at some level, we're still struggling with the same problem, although we've made huge progress. Um, so, you know, we have far, far more data now. We're starting to see these, um, these intermediate mass black holes. So we have a better handle on the pathways. So here on this, this this infographic, I suppose you might call it, we have the mass of the black holes here. This is where we're trying to get to, try to understand where these ones come from. And then we start with something back here. And, you know, our redshift is like time ago. Um, so maybe we start with these seeds. These could Some some people still think they might be stars. I, it seems unlikely to me, to be honest, at least not as we understand them. Um, it could be that the stars are more massive, though. That could be true. And that this, you know, you get this massive growth. If that's true, then we probably have a we're missing a lot of black holes then of, of that intermediate mass, that hundred thousand solar mass. That's really the key at this point, or ten thousand solar masses. We need to build those up, understand them, but they're hard to find, hard to see. Um, so that's that's probably where the the future lies, that the prospects for the future. Um, so we're, like I said, we're going through a kind of a golden age at the moment. And I've, now with JWST was launched there on Christmas Day successfully um, again after a couple of decades of, of development um, so that was at least a decade behind schedule if not more and you know 10 billion dollars over budget but, but who's counting and um, so that will that will detect many more massive black holes out to much larger distances so that will that will be revolutionary in itself it's not exactly it is well it is kind of designed for black holes but not exactly and it, it, it's really designed to look at galaxies far away but Black holes are in galaxies, so it will detect them as well. Uh, and it'll detect, you know, very interesting objects. Lisa will probably be the game changer, uh, but that's not due for launch now until 2037. So, you know, it's, that's not imminent, let's say. Well, not imminent in the human scale. It's imminent in the cosmological scale. You know, blink of an eye. Um, but um, the good thing about Lisa, uh, so Lisa is like LIGO in space. It's a, it's a gravitational wave observatory designed to work in space. They're, the arm lengths are now instead of being four kilometers long as LIGO is, it'll be 2.5 million kilometers long. Um, and that's why you need to go to space. And um, technology is well understood, though. That's that's a huge bonus for, for Lisa. 
for JWST, the problem there was that technology needed to be developed. And that's really what slowed it down, as you can imagine. Um, Athena then is, is an X-ray telescope. That's again, not due for launch for quite a while. Um, there was an X-ray telescope. He told me that went up there, um, God, it must be about five years ago. It blew up in space after about a week. Um, so that didn't go well. Um, so we're kind of X-ray telescope light at the moment. Um, so that's, that's a problem for detecting black holes because that's predominantly where they shine in is the X-rays. Well, on top of that, then the theorists need to do their jobs as well. Um, next generation computer simulations, um, trying to model black holes and galaxy formation, trying to make predictions for LISA, JWST, and also interpret what JWST will see as well. So like JWST will often give us back observations which we need to interpret. It won't always be obvious what we're looking at. So we need to have detailed models to understand that. Um, so that's the future. Okay, that's 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 it. So I think I'm in time, or just about at least. It's always hard to judge these things. So hopefully, hopefully everybody got something out of that. John, thank you very much indeed. Um, I hope you can hear me. That was yeah. uh, a really excellent talk on what is, uh, let's face it, a very difficult subject. Uh, very difficult to get your head around. Um, there's a few questions there. Um, if you're happy to, to, to answer, try and answer those anyway. Um, maybe, maybe I could kick off. Um, Unfortunately, the, the bandwidth problems were kicking in and out, and uh, you probably didn't know, but uh, you were breaking up and you were sounding like you were being sucked into a black hole at some oh, stage. Sorry, it was, sorry. It was really strange. But anyway, um, I'm not sure whether you said that all galaxies do or don't have a black hole. And my understanding was they, they don't all have black holes at the core. And, and, and that's, that's, that's particularly interesting because you mentioned the relationship between um, Sorry, there's somebody at my door, would you believe, just in the middle of this? <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's particularly interesting in the relationship between the black hole and the galaxy itself. Yeah, no. Um, so I think I think it's fair, like every, every galaxy, um, let me see, um, about a billion or more stars. Um, I'm probably breaking up again there. Um, what a billion or more stars, it, we think the occupation fraction, so by that I mean every galaxy should have a black hole. As far as we can tell, that's absolutely true. Um, there was some debate maybe about that in the past, but I think the more we look, the more we see. And so every every massive galaxy has a, so every galaxy, uh, this really should have like, it'd be easier if I put galaxy mass down here, but every every massive galaxy, so anything like at least the size of our own galaxy, and even ones that are 10 times smaller, all we, we always see them at black holes all the way up as the black as the galaxies get smaller then the occupation gets less and we don't don't all we don't believe they all have black holes but we don't know exactly what the fraction is and in some ways that's that's our problem if we could get a better handle on smaller the the, the mass of the galaxy the mass of the black hole in the smaller galaxies or if they don't have them that would be a good, biggest that would be a big clue for us in um, exactly where these black holes came from. Yeah, no, no, that, that all makes sense. Just just one other thought I'm having, which is about dark matter and, and, and black holes. You know, I, I just wonder if any in any way the dynamics of the galaxies, which of course suggest that there's a black ma a black matter or dark matter uh, influence and all that stuff. Just wonder if there's any relationship there building or have, is that something that's um, a lot more work? <laughs> Like not really, like not not directly. So so black holes are completely um, 